Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome, uh, everyone from our precious Pakenham uh, community of faith and also our visitors and guests and those who are watching us live and will watch us later as a recording. Uh, welcome uh, to the Pakenham Lakeside Adventist Church. Uh, today we are going to have a communion service. And for those who are visitors, I want you to know uh, that in our churches globally, the communion service is an open one. It means that even if you are not a member of the Adventist Church, but you believe in uh, the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you are most welcome to participate together with our faith community, together with our church family. Okay. Today I would like to talk to you about amazing grace. When I was a kid living behind the Iron Curtain, not knowing anything from the Bible or even about the Bible, just having heard the name, I, as an atheist, knew a small number of Bible verses, maybe four or five. And one of those verses was the verse that was read to you today as Scripture. Luke 23, verse 34. If you have your Bibles, please open them. We'll be reading from Luke 23 and uh, a number of texts surrounding this, uh, this verse. But thank you, Emily, for reading us uh, this text. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In the King James Version, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing they do. So, as a kid, as an atheist, in uh, some literature I read this verse and it jumped into my mind and it stayed there. That on the cross Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And today I will try to link this text, to the everlasting theme which was perpetuated by uh, a great English author at the end of the 18th century. And he called this great anthem, which potentially is the greatest anthem or hymn of all time, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So amazing grace, this mercy that no one deserves, this graciousness, this love, everything that God has in his character was manifested there on the cross 2,000 years ago. We mentioned this uh, during the pandemic when we explored the second commandment, uh, when we looked at the character of God as expressed in the law of God. Uh, you all remember uh, how far God's mercy and blessing extend and far far God's judgment extends. You remember God said that if people engage in idolatry in the second commandment, if they worship the images, uh, then God's judgment will accompany them until the third and the fourth generation. But if they love me and keep my commandments, I'll bless them for how long? For a thousand years generations, those who love me and keep my commandments. A basic modern mathematical formula would potentially tell you that if God's blessing and his mercy extends for a thousand generations, but God's judgment is just for three to four, we may assume that uh, God's grace is 250 times greater than his judgment. So generally speaking, this great God who fills with his presence the whole universe and who is so mighty, who made the stars and the galaxies and the solar system and us as mankind, this great omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient God, he is, generally speaking, a very kind God because his kindness is 250 times greater than his anger. Yes, the Bible has the word God's wrath. We cannot 
uh, erase those words from the Bible. God is not a doormat on which you may wipe your feet. The Bible says that at the end of time, there will be a very mighty judgment over all evil, a complete annihilation of sin and evil and Lucifer for all time, for all eternity. And yet, all of those uh, magnificent and, uh, and awesome events of the apocalypse, they are 250 times smaller in their magnitude than God's everlasting love, care, and grace. If you read the book Great Controversy, uh, in fact, I like the way Ellen White um, uh, started and finished her uh, main five volumes where she describes the biblical history from patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, desire of ages, acts of the apostles, and great controversy. And uh, the book uh, Patriarchs and Prophets starts with the phrase, God is love. And then this love is distorted, is marred, is, uh, is forgotten by mankind. And at the end of the book, Great Controversy, chapter 42, the final words of the book are, that's for all eternity, God's redeemed Rescued creation will sing and praise, recite and repeat that God is what? God is love. God who is love is the essence of everything in the universe. It is the very essence of God. It is his nature. It is his beauty. It is his magnetism. It is his attraction. So look at the, let's look at the verses surrounding the statement of Christ. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Just look at a few preceding verses, verse 26 and onwards. So look at, now the sentence is there. Jesus will die. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way uh, in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now look at verse 27. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. Just think about Jesus, about his nature. Uh, can you imagine... Uh, uh, just try to recall the time when you were injured. Is it an easy time? I still remember when in 2012, in a, in a sports club during training, I dislocated my right elbow very badly. And, uh, and I was waiting for the ambulance and I saw it, my dislocated elbow and the bones sticking out. It was a horrible scene. And, uh, and I didn't feel good at all. It was a painful experience. Or when I was a kid, I once was uh, uh, dropped on myself uh, the, uh, the pot with boiling water and burned my feet. Again, uh, that swelled and there were those balloons of skin on top for many weeks to come. When you are injured, it's, no, it's not a fun experience. All you think is just your injury. Uh, all you think is just your pain. And Jesus is already injured. Just think about uh, him being taken to a place of punishment and uh, the Roman soldiers are flogging him. And they're flogging him with uh, those flogs which have uh, the tips of bone and, and, and metal on the, uh, on, uh, on the edges that uh, break your flesh, tear your skin. And the Roman soldiers, as history tells us, often put salt on the wounds so that they could intensify uh, this burning sensation to make your pain 10 out of 10. And he's already been beaten multiple times. Just think about this and hearing of these cruel people, of their sadistic uh, behavior when they uh, hit Jesus, slam Jesus, when they, uh, and then ask, her, who slammed you? Who hit you? It seems that uh, the members of the Sanhedrin, who on one hand were most knowledgeable in Torah and the commandments of God, are actually enjoying the beating and the infliction of pain on a helpless human being. And so Jesus is already not in one piece. He is already bleeding. He is already beaten, full of bruises. 
a crown of thorns, those sharp thorns piercing his skin on the forehead. He's already uh, in uh, a state of constant pain and suffering. And yet when he is dragged, kicked forward to the cross, he finds a moment to show compassion to the crying women who are puzzled, who do not understand what's happening. This same kind Jesus who just uh, weeks or months ago held their children on, on his hands and blessed them, who healed their loved ones, who raised the dead. This super popular rabbi, a very strange man from Nazareth. What's happening? So those women do not have any answers. All they can do is show compassion and cry and mourn. They're mourning the death of Jesus almost in advance because they all know he's going to die. And in response, he shows kindness. The same kind of kindness he showed to his mom uh, when, uh, as John describes in chapter 19 of his gospel, he told uh, John the apostle to take care of his mom. He says, here's your son and here's your, here's your mom. I will just look after her. Just think about how much courage and how much love and compassion Jesus has even in the middle of the worst suffering. When he is there, when he is being spat, rocks are flying from every direction, and he says, don't mourn, don't cry. Look after yourselves, because the bad times are coming. Jerusalem will suffer the time when you would not even want to have children. Verse 31, for if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And you all remember what will happen to one of those criminals. I think when Jesus engages in a dialogue with that criminal, he has almost left the world. He is almost dead because uh, you remember when Jesus uh, gives the promise to the criminal that he will be with him in paradise uh, at the end of time, uh, almost immediately after that, Jesus dies. So just can you imagine, you've, you've bled, you're, you were in pain, you're about to die. Your consciousness may not be that clear that Jesus scrambles his last effort to talk to this criminal. And tell him, this penitent sinner, that though both of them today will share the same destiny and go to rest in the grave, but he will be with him in paradise. So again, compassion and care. Compassion and care. Love everywhere. That's what you see on and on and on on the cross. And, uh, uh, and again, the crowd that is looking at, at Jesus they're mocking him. They're ruthless. Look at how abusive the audience is. Verse 35, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. It seems that the vast majority of people is not with him. They are against him. Only a handful of brave people like his disciple John, his own mom, some uh, wailing women on the roads uh, to Calvary. The Roman centurion who after his death would say this was the son of God. Uh, again, only a few. The disciples scattered. Peter had already denied him thrice a few hours before that. And the crowd is mocking, laughing, making an ugly, bloody spectacle out of this scene. The crowd entertains itself in bloodshed and suffering. That's uh, thus revealing the essence of human nature. And this human nature is in us there, deep inside, throughout hundreds of years. And there are still many people who enjoy giving pain to others, even in their own families even to their own children. Even in war, destroying countries and nations. So there is Jesus. And yet, he says, looking at this crowd, 
knowing that many of them will never be saved. He says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. I think just like in John 3.16 and many other cardinal verses of the Bible, like John, 1 John 4.8, God is love. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, and many other texts, uh, Romans 5.8, where it says, God demonstrates his love to us that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. There are many texts in the Bible uh, that show the beauty of God's character. Uh, Romans 8, where Paul says, uh, what can separate us from the love of God? Is it height or width or depth? Nothing in the world can separate us from the love of God. And I think this is one of those most wonderful cardinal texts in the whole Bible. Out of 31,000 uh, 31, verses in the scriptures, this text stands out as the proclamation of God's character, his forgiveness, his care and love. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What message can you and I draw from our reading today. Well, of course, the first message that is going to be reiterated by the church participating in the symbols of, God, of Christ's body and blood uh, in the communion service is that today we proclaim God's love on the cross for all mankind over and over and over again. Though we know these things like ABC, but it's still the most important thing to learn, know, Preserve and cherish in your mind and your heart the cross. The cross is in the middle of everything in the Bible. And on the cross you see Christ. There on the cross, his phrase, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, becomes his uh, forever intercessory prayer. As the high priest, now interceding on your and mine behalf before his Father in judgment, saying, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And then covering us all by the white robe of his righteousness. That he gives us so freely, so generously, by way of acceptance, by way of faith. And here on the cross, Jesus again shows us the beauty of his character. His forgiving nature. Even when the whole world has stood their backs on you. He is there to forgive. And my friend, we as human beings in our sinful nature, deep in our hearts, we are not naturally a forgiving people. We are not naturally forgiving. It's natural for us to bear grudges, to hold upsets, to think of revenges. It's natural for us to go eye for eye. Or even more. But once Christ comes into your life and mind. When Christ, when Christ gives us a new birth. This forgiving nature becomes yours and mine. And even if the whole world were to put you on the cross. You will repeat with Christ the words. Father forgive them. For they know not what they do. That's the beauty of Christianity. That's the beauty of the community of faith. And that is God's children who are sinful but forgiven, who are unrighteous but righteous in Christ, who are dirty but clean, covered by the righteousness of Jesus. When somebody hurts them, they always go to the cross. And at the cross they ask, God, I don't, like, like, I don't feel like forgiving that person. I'm hurt. I hate that person. But, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Give me power and mindset and desire to do what Jesus did on the cross and forget, forgive that person who upset and hurt me. Let the world know about our community as the community of loving, caring, and forgiving people. Let me emphasize, forgiving people, even in the worst of the circumstances. Let us celebrate today the love of God in this wonderful communion ceremony, in the foot washing ceremony, in all the ceremonies that deepen our spiritual experience in Christ. Would you please bow your heads and we're going to pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for giving us the gospel 
and the amazing grace manifested on the cross and in the words of Christ. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Make these words natural for us. Make these words a part of our nature. And today we begin this communion service now with a grateful heart and mind for the cross, for your love, for your suffering, for your sacrifice. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.